Welcome to the Transform Podcast. My name is Andrew Farhat. I am the lead pastor of St. John's Church and School in Denver, Colorado, right across the street from Wash Park. And in this podcast, what we do is we consider what it looks like to follow Jesus. We consider what it looks like uh, to be committed to a Christ-centered worldview and operate with that as our lifestyle. This podcast is for you if you are seeking what that might look like or if you have already committed your life to Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Transform Podcast. I'm Andrew Farhat. I'm here with guest PJ Arswald. Welcome, PJ. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. PJ is an awesome pastor and a great partner in ministry. So grateful for the opportunity that God called us to be together uh, during an awesome season in an awesome city um, that I think we can see that, man, our city needs Jesus, does it not? Yeah, well, that's true of the whole world right now, but it's fun to get to do ministry here in Denver. There's a lot of people uh, looking for something, and um, we know that that thing is ultimately Jesus. Absolutely. And I want to encourage you that if you uh, like anything that you have heard today, I want to invite you to follow us wherever you podcast as we want to continue to spread the word of God. And our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Today, we have a great question, and it has to do with, I think, Christianity being such a bloody religion. And it's like, all right, why did Jesus have to die in order for God the Father to take away our sins? And when you think about it, it's really a good question because, uh, like, if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ, like, certainly Jesus' death was no, like, easy, like, like he died in his sleep. <laughs> like, he was scourged and then crucified, one of the most horrific deaths in human history, one of the worst ways I can think of of dying. Like, that looked awful. Um, and so why did there need to be so much shedding of blood? Why did there need to be so much, uh, I think a biblical word is atonement. All right, I'm kind of giving away the answer. Uh, why did there need to be so much pain and suffering on the cross? So I guess um, I'll just open it up to you, PJ, to, to get us started with that question and get the ball rolling. Like, why did God have to do it that way? Yeah, well, I'm going to start off with a bit of an unusual answer. <laughs> and I'm going to say that he perhaps didn't. One of the interesting things when we talk about God is we always have to be careful not to put God in a box uh, that he himself is not put into. So um, we have been given this great gift of reason and logic. And so sometimes we piece things together and it's good. We can learn more about what God has done and his son, Jesus. Um, at the same time, we just want to be careful never to say God has to do this because he's God and he can really do whatever he wants. And so I like to think of this question as what does it show us? <clears throat> what are we shown by God? in the fact that he gave his son Jesus. And I think we'll talk about this, but there's a certain idea that God is showing the severity of sin. He's showing the cost of forgiveness. He's showing the price that had to be paid, that there was no small thing um, that needed to be overcome. And so God is showing us a lot of different things about his character, his justice, and then ultimately, as we'll get towards the end, what then it looks like for us to follow him and the same cost that we then bear. All right. So there's a, I think there's a big word that you use there and God, the father wanted to show us the cost or the price that needed to be paid. And so I think that goes into a, a little bit of, you know, our lives, um, when we are wronged by somebody else, you know, let's, let's talk about, you know, maybe a heinous way or a severe way. I think that we would all agree that if you are wronged by somebody in a heinous way, that, man, there's pain that occurs when you're wronged by someone. Yeah. In the relationship, uh, the pain that you carry. It's not like you're just like, oh, let's just sweep this under the rug. Like we, we have that phrase for a reason. Mm -hmm. We have that phrase, sweep it under the rug, because we say that to somebody like, when they like don't do anything about a major offense and they just let stuff go. So they're not really taking the pain seriously. So to start, I have a, a quote from the late Tim Keller, uh, one of my favorite authors, as everyone knows here on the podcast. <laughs> um, he says this great quote, 
Um, and it's, it goes like this. It's from the book Forgiveness, by the way, which uh, appears to be an awesome book. I've kind of looked at several quotes from it, but man, it looks really good. If you are in a situation where you need to forgive someone, whether it is a family member, whether it is whoever, this book is really going to help you understand. So look at this quote, God's grace and forgiveness while free to the recipient are always costly for the giver. From the earliest parts of the Bible, it was understood that God could not forgive without sacrifice. No one who is seriously wrong can just forgive the perpetrator. You ever heard that? Just forgive. Yeah. Right? But here's what he says. But when you forgive, that means you absorb the loss and the debt. Hmm. You bear it yourself. All forgiveness, then, is costly. So then what he is saying is that forgiveness is a form of voluntary suffering where someone is bearing the cost. Now, I think we could all relate to that from our own human experience, but then it's another dimension to think about it in God's relationship to his creatures, human beings. But I think it begs the question, PJ, which I think our culture struggles with, and that's the, the issue of sin. Like, I think we think sin is like, yeah, like you cheated on your wife or you murdered someone. Like, it's a really bad thing you did. But like most people are good and they don't, you know, intend to do those sorts of things or do those things. Yeah. Um, so what would you say to the person that says, but I'm a good person? Like, what would you say to them? Yeah, well, I think uh, this is where... The Bible paints this really beautiful, nuanced, complex picture of the human creature. So as humans, we were originally created in God's image to carry out his work and his will. And so there's a certain aspect that we were molded and shaped to represent God to the world. Now, in the fall, that is marred. And so um, sometimes we don't feel like we're bad, because we, especially comparison. This is where comparison is so dangerous. When we compare ourselves to others, you'll either fall into despair because you're way worse than somebody, or you'll fall into pride because, wow, look how bad they are. Look how good I am. And so God has a really high view of the severity of sin. And we tend to just think of like really extreme things as sin. And yet you look at the, the story of scripture and what God cares about. He cares about a lot of little things too that we might brush off. You think of Moses. So Moses leads the people out of Egypt and he's this good faithful servant and he deals with all of their grumbling and he goes up, he gets the Ten Commandments. And then at one point he gets a little frustrated and he smacks a rock and kind of calls into question God's authority and God's punishment for him is you're not going to see the promised land now, this land that you've been marching towards. Um, and so we tend to think of ourselves either way worse than we probably are, um, although it's really hard to really grasp the depth of our depravity, um, or we tend to kind of brush aside things. And so God calls us to look at what does he ask of us and then how are we doing with that? It, the law of God's will, his love for us serves as a bit of a mirror and that we can look at in the mirror and say, Ooh, there's a lot more uh, blemishes than I realized. And so whenever we feel overly good, like, yeah, I think I'm probably fine. Uh, it's helpful to look at what is God asking me to do? And when I start to look at the commandments, when I start to look at um, what Jesus has called us to live like, um, I pretty quickly find more areas that I'm failing in than I'm probably succeeding in. Um, and I have a lot of ways that God has, you know, helped me grow over the, t the years. But I think it's uh, pretty revealing once we take a, a good, honest look. You know, you, you say something very insightful, PJ, as always, um, when you talk about uh, God had something punitive for Moses um, when he sinned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I think as human beings, we like to have it both ways. So I know some people that say, man, God was really harsh towards Moses. Uh, but then I know so many people, the same people, that would get really upset if they knew that someone who had committed crimes was mm. let off by a judge. Yeah. Like they'd be like, man, why is the law so lenient in our state? Criminals keep doing the same things. Um, things take long to prosecute. Uh, there's so many criminals that know how to play the system and they never have anything punitive happen to them. And so they continue to do the same things because they know that they're going to get let off. They know that they're going to just have like a, a minimal slap on the wrist. And so God is serious about our sin and he wants us to have uh, some consequences when it comes to it. 
And so he's, he's kind of waking us up to that. And so now the, the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God wants to show us how much he loves us by sending his one and only son to bear the penalty. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is bearing the penalty for everybody's sin. Everybody's sin deserves God's judgment, but yet Jesus is taking the judgment for us because he loves us. And it's so that he would bear the cost to cancel our debt before God. So this kind of makes me jump, you know, to another point here. And it's this PJ, have you ever heard the idea, man, uh, you should just, you know, love yourself, uh, forgive yourself. Uh, you should, uh, just know like that, that God, you know, has nice thoughts about you and God loves you, but where is the tangible action mm -hmm. that God took to prove it to the person so that they would really know it and feel it and experience it and say, man, I know God's lo God loves me. Yeah. Well, that's where, again, we like to just make ourselves, we like to relieve ourselves of uncomfortableness as much as possible. It's part of the reason why we flee to distraction. That's we flee point. to substances and stuff. We don't like to feel bad. And so usually then we use this kind of language like, oh, you know, give yourself grace or just, hey, go easy on yourself. And mm -hmm. um, we can talk about where that's rightly applied. But in a lot of times, it's just a way to get out scotch free. Whereas you talked about um, the cost and everything, I think in the severity of sin, first off, just one last thought on if you feel like you're so good, um, go to the Sermon on the Mount, because that's where Jesus talks to a lot of people who feel like they're doing pretty good. And he says, oh, you've heard it said, do not murder. Well, if you've hated your brother, you've committed murder. So um, he uh, is pretty convicting there. But the cross and when Jesus is crucified is this picture of what it looks like for divine love, what true love actually looks like, where it comes from, everything else flows from that. Uh, it shows us how severe those sins are. So if we think like, oh, my actions aren't that bad. Well, in order to atone for those, in order to cover those, Jesus had to endure that. Like that's how big those sins were. I think that's one of the reasons why we we have worship on Good Friday. It's to not just look past the fact that there was a cost. There was a severe, extreme measure that had to be taken. And that was a measure that we deserved. And that's, again, hard if we like to think of ourselves as just inherently good. But apart from Jesus Christ, what he suffered, that was our, that's ours. Paul says in Romans, the wage of sin is death. Anyone who sinned, what have you earned? What's the payment for that? Well, you get to die, both temporally in this world and then eternally in eternal death. So Jesus took that all on, but it's also the the action that we can say, this is where God showed his love for the world, that he was willing to give his own son and Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us. So it's not just, oh, I, I feel like making myself feel better and so I'm going to be nice to myself. When I feel crummy, when I feel sinful, when I'm aware of that, I don't look to myself. I don't look to just glossing over stuff. I look to Jesus who took whatever I'm feeling crummy about and took it upon himself and was willing to be nailed to a cross. Um, ultimately, that's where the, the love was shown. That's powerful. That's very powerful. And, you know, I'll just say this. Um, as we talk about this, PJ, I think that there's this significant truth that needs to really sink in to our hearts. And some of us know it, but yet it's a truth that uh, needs to be revisited over and over again. And it's the good news that we're forgiven before God. Like <laughs> That's huge. We are forgiven. Uh, God demonstrates his love for us that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and the truth of the gospel leads us to say this, since I'm forgiven much, I will forgive others. And I believe that this is the highest virtue of Christianity. I believe that this is a test of your understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Can you forgive another person? The more we rejoice in our own forgiveness, the more we can forgive someone else. And so if you're listening and you're like, 
man, um, I am contemplating not forgiving my spouse or my children or my grandchildren or a friend or someone else that wronged me. The power of the gospel is that Jesus made atonement, that he canceled your debt. It's freedom. And when you forgive others, you're living in freedom too. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And that's where Jesus has a very potent parable on this about an unmerciful servant who's forgiven this enormous debt, like a debt that nobody could ever pay off in their lifetime. And his master forgives him all of it. And then he goes to somebody who just owes him a little bit, refuses to forgive him his debt, you know, finds him in jail. And the whole point is Dr. Joel Komodo summarizes that parable. He says, Jesus is saying, forgive or else. <laughs> it's If you don't want forgiveness to operate in your life, it's a, it's kind of like a two-way door. If you don't want to forgive, then you're also choosing not to receive forgiveness. It's It just naturally flows out. If we understand what we've been, what's been done for us, what we've received, it's going to flow in a life of forgiveness. And that's where too, like when we, when we're sinned against, when we're hurt, I, I love that Andrew, you talked about the absorption of pain. Um, it hurts. So don't feel bad when you're struggling to forgive somebody, but there's a big difference between, man, this hurts to forgive you. And I, I don't even want to try. I'm not even going to hope to get there. I'm just content. Um, forgiveness, like you said, is costly. Um, it hurts. It also is like a forfeiting of power. Um, if somebody sins against me, I can hold that over their head the rest of my life if I want. You know, if somebody were mm-hmm. to, I don't know, steal from my company and I went bankrupt, I can spend my whole life bitter. And I, for whenever they try and do anything, I can say, well, you always did that one thing to me. And and to forgive somebody is to, to release power. I'm no longer going to hold this action over you. Um, you think of Jesus on the cross. He's being <laughs> mocked and they're, you know, doing all sorts of terrible things to him. He, he's naked. He's been beaten. Who would have blamed Jesus if he would have just sent lightning down on everyone there? <laughs> like they, they would totally deserve it. And yet it was a, a powerless move that he did to, to release power, not to hold it against them, but rather say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. So um, I think you're 100% right, Andrew, where the forgiveness we've received, when we look to Jesus on the cross, it's, a, um, it's meant to be a source of love that flows to us, forgives us our sins, and then flows out of us um, to lead us into lives that forgive others. PJ, I think when, when I hear you talk, it does uh, make me think about uh, the legal system. So like, hmm. what if there's somebody that commits a sin against you that's also a crime? Yeah. So um, would you say that Christians should um, completely drop it? Or is there something to be said about the justice system that God has set up and the the sword, I think is what Romans 13 would say. Like there's a, there's a something God's ordained to punish evil, but yet sometimes like I think people could drop charges and move on or sometimes they're willing to press charges and they still forgive, but they still also want the justice system to be utilized. What would you say to that? No, it's a really good question. Uh, It gets into kind of our understanding from Paul on what's often called two kingdoms or or two realms that God has established in this world um, a couple different avenues to carry his will. On the one hand, you have the authorities, the government, um, the princes, the kings and queens of this world, um, the judiciary system, as you referenced, that are meant to carry out justice. So they are meant to embody God's will for justice to occur. So wrongdoing is curbed evil is punished, good is upheld, so on. Uh, at the same time, then he has the church established to be this bearer of grace and gospel forgiveness. And so both exist in the world, and they're not contrary to one another, but they're both carrying out different aspects of who God is. And so that's one where, you know, when a crime is committed, um, you can forgive that person, and that doesn't mean you do everything in your power to make sure that no legal action is taken against them. Like, oh, I've forgiven them, so there's no consequences. Right. Um, there are consequences in this world, and that's and again, you read scripture, God holds his people accountable for their actions too, while at the same time forgiving them. Um, it's a both and. And so we can forgive and still the government can carry out its job to enforce the laws. And hopefully those laws are in accordance to God's will. Um, it, and it varies. You know, you might have something happen. Let's say somebody smashes your car, right? This is where forgiveness is costly. If I'm going to forgive them and not press any charges, I'm eating the 
10 grand, 15 grand, whatever it costs to fix the car, buy a new car. Um, at this, so I can choose to do that. Um, at the same time, is it good and right if they, the person who's responsible has to deal with the consequences of their actions? Like that's, that's okay too. And so that's where as Christians, yeah. we have a little bit of a, um, an interesting, we can talk through these things. We can talk to fellow Christians. We can try and wrestle with it. Uh, is there a risk that if the law is not enforced, that this person can hurt my neighbor? Are they going to continue in this? That's something real to take in consideration. Is this just an accident that I can bear the cost of? Um, those are all worthy things to think about and to wrestle with. I will say, uh, Jesus has some strong words for how Christians, and Paul does too, how Christians deal with one another. So if a Christian sins against one another, um, the first instinct should not be to go to the courts and <laughs> to deal with it in that regard. Rather, you go to them individually, bring two or three, go to the church. Um, and the Bible specifically says that for Christians, it is a kind of a blight against our witness when we cannot deal with things on our own and we have to go around suing one another. So within the Christian community, there's a, a whole different story, but the long and short is, and Andrew, if you have any other thoughts, chime in, but uh, we can kind of navigate that. We, we can forgive somebody and it's not wrong if the legal system still takes its course of action for the consequences of what's been done, especially if it's been evil done against somebody. Um, if there's a case that we want to help forgive them and, and prevent that, we could. Um, but that's not so that we have to do that because um, God has established the government to carry out his justice in the world. And so um, it's not a bad thing when it does that very thing. Yeah, I think you make some really excellent points, PJ. And I think I would say that Christians are called to be peacemakers. So Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, and then Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul says, walk in love as God has loved us and has uh, given his one and only son for us. So we're, and then Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, at the end of the chapter, he's talking about forgiving as you've been forgiven. So you make a good point. Two believers should be willing to come together mm -hmm. and to face each other, right? However, I would also say this, if it is a major crime committed, um, what you said about loving your neighbor, like the reason for uh, the governing authorities yeah. and the justice system is to protect, right? To protect against more sin. So if they don't have any consequences and they're just on the loose still, they could commit more sin and they could sin against more people. So I really liked how you put that with like, if charges are pressed and there is something punitive that the government does, that's love too. And so I think sometimes we divorce love from wrath. Hmm. And we talked about this with um, uh, AJ in a previous episode that God's love and wrath are not divorced. They're always together. Yeah. And in the justice system, by the grace of God, when it's working at its best, <laughs> yeah. there's love and wrath too. And so I think that's really important. Also, PJ, you mentioned um, Romans, or sorry, the, the concept of the two kingdoms. And for those of you that's a new concept, it comes from Martin Luther, the reformer. Um, he said that he was trying to extract from scripture a way and a, a paradigm for us to understand it better. And then the kingdom of, uh, there's the kingdom of the world that is governed by the law primarily the civil law, and it's to curb and to punish sin and to protect. So that's a, a realm that Christians live in, right? Mm -hmm. But then there is another realm, which is the kingdom of God, in which that is where we are to practice forgiveness as Christians and walk in love as, as God has loved us. So I really appreciate that because I think that I've heard some negative thoughts about Luther's doctrine of the two kingdoms recently and i'm like well no i think he was on to something that's helpful if you understand it uh, appropriately yeah what i think it's trying to help navigate is the tension between you know paul and peter are very explicit obey the authorities they're there for they're they're placed by god for your good not for your bad so obey them but then you also have the apostles in the book of acts who are on trial for proclaiming jesus and are told by the authorities hey shut up stop talking about jesus and they say, you know, we obey God, not man. And so there's this tension we always live in where we, we live in this world and there are people that God has placed that sometimes do well with his will and sometimes don't. And so we're trying to navigate what does it look like to follow Christ? What does it look like to follow the people God has established? Where are the tensions there? And so, yeah, hopefully this is a good paradigm 
to lead us to live better Christian lives, not to give us a free pass to disobey people or forfeit our Christian faith just because, oh, I was told by the government to do this. It's it's always hard um, when they're not in great alignment. And so this paradigm, yeah, just meant to help us um, think through things. Absolutely. And, and just to wrap it up today with kind of a closing thought, I would say this to the listener. Um, if you ever get into the lukewarm feeling of following Jesus or you ever are, let's say, despairing about how much God loves you. Um, today's podcast, I hope, by the grace of God, will show how high and wide and deep the love of God is for us in Jesus Christ. God loves you. God gives you a new beginning in Jesus. You are a new creation in Christ. You are a son and daughter of God. And so may you live out of that identity. May you live out of that purpose that he has given to you um, while you are here on this earth. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you were blessed by today's message and you'd like to share it with someone else, uh, we encourage you to share and subscribe. We also want to invite you to share any questions that you would have us answer on this podcast. And you could submit those questions to hello at sjdenver.org, and we'll see you next time. Take care.